Okay. We'll move on. So just as a warm up and as a practice of using the text tool, if everybody could use the text tool to type in your name and what and where you teach and what the weather is like in your location, and that can be literally or metaphorically. Well, Bronia, are you able to find the text tool? Um, I can show you where it is if you're having trouble. You might want to select this one. There she is. Okay, great. We have hot and humid in Tokyo, cool and cloudy in SF, and we'll find out the weather in Burlingame. Great. Perfect weather in Burlingame. Good to hear. Okay. Well, let's um, move on to uh, Karen. I'll hand it over to you for the goal. Thanks, Charlotte. Can everyone hear me? I um, just wanted to quickly review the goals of the series of webinars. So this is the third in the series, but they all also work as standalone. And the goal is to help support seventh grade teachers to enhance the work they're doing on teaching about medieval Japan um, with an emphasis on um, incorporating the Common Core as well as the Global Competencies, which um, we're lucky to have World Savvy as a partner on. And throughout all these webinars, we're incorporating strategies on using our collections to help teach these different content areas. Um, our first webinar was very, um, it was very much like a lecture content focus. So if you didn't have a chance to see that, in the reminder email there is a link and you can find it on our website. It's the standard narrative and it's a nice overarching um, background of the history content. And then we also have links to the second webinar we did on symbols of protection um, in Buddhist deities and armor and so on. So um, then to the next slide. These are a series of learning objectives that we're, that we're trying to accomplish today. Um, but there, there is real strong emphasis on comparing and contrasting how different representations um, of, a, of a story across, um, across different, uh, using different media, um, how artists treat the same story in different ways. Okay. Now here we have uh, just wanting to practice the clip art tool on that same bar. You can select any of those fun shapes on the clip art tool and then place your clip art on, on the continuum just to get a sense of what our different comfort levels are on teaching about Japan as well as our comfort levels in teaching about critical media literacy. And we all, of course, have different places where we're going to fall on this. But this is to give me an idea.
Hold on just a minute. Okay, well that is um that is quite a range, I see. Great. So we have a range of both. It's a pretty diverse group. Thank you. Do we have anybody else? Uh, okay. I think it's the four of us. We have one person missing on the comfort level on Japan. Anyone want it? There we go. Okay. Looks good. Well, that gives me a sense. Thank you. Now, I just want to briefly mention uh, something about what we call global competencies. At World Savvy, which is the organization that I work for, we work on developing this notion, this, mat this is a matrix of what we call global competencies. And together they signify an overall willingness and ability to understand and act on issues of global importance. Now our notion of global competence, you'll see here on this matrix how it, it envelops uh, values and attitudes, behaviors, skills, all within uh, the larger core concepts. And the details, I'm not going to go into this right now, but there is a more fleshed out explanation of this matrix, like what are the core concepts, what are those values and attitudes, what are those behaviors and skills that are in the supplementary packet to this webinar. Um, but just to say one thing about it, uh, global competency is a, way, is a way of understanding and it's a way of being in the world. All right, I'm going to pass it over to Karen now, who's going to lead us through our first activity. Okay, great. So the first thing we'd like to do is try an activity um, that builds closed looking, and it's called Looking Five Times Two, and it was developed by Project Zero. And you don't need to go into your packet now, but after. Um, the webinar, take a look at your packet. We have some graphic organizers that you can use to facilitate these looking activities. So we're going to do two. One is looking five times two, and the other is called See, Think, Wonder. So the first thing I would like you to do is just get a pencil or pen and a piece of scratch paper and take a look at the screen. And I know it's you know, not easy to see all the details. Um, that's totally okay. So just what I'd like you to do is write down five words or phrases describing what you see. So take a moment to um, gather a, a piece of paper and a pencil and then just we'll look for about 30 seconds and just write down five words or phrases to describe what you see. Okay, now I'm going to start going into some detail slides and continue adding to your list. Take a look at one of these details and write down five adjectives or phrases that describe the thoughts or feelings this image provokes. Just anything that comes to mind to continue your descriptive writing. Here's another detail from that screen. If you continue um, to add 
describing words, words or phrases to your list. Also start paying attention to the materials. One more detail. You can continue to add to your list anything new that you see. You might want to start thinking about the thoughts or feelings that you're having about this image. Okay, now what I'd like you to do is, using your text tool, if you could start entering in into the C section, what were some of the, some of the things you observed? What did you see? And then in the think section, what are some of your thoughts about what you're seeing? What are you thinking about as you're starting to connect your, what you see with what you know? And then you wonder, what questions do you have about the screen and what you saw. So it's okay if it's all over the place. You can just start um, filling in and maybe pick a different color based on who you are. So like I see one person's using red. Well, if it's complicated, don't worry about it. But if you wanted to, you could use a different color. And then we'll start using this to talk about the screen and see what ideas we can generate. Use your text tool, so type on the big A. Sometimes it takes a couple tries, too. See, we see stealth, samurai, persevering, sort of amongst golden clouds with mountains and trees and gullies. The dwellings are shrouded in that golden fog. This golden cloud schema occurs a lot in um, Japanese screens, actually. Tumultuous ocean and ships. <laughs> the green is a little tricky to see. There's balance. The wind. There's the boats. Oh, that's right, the scene with the army that was falling over the cliff. They're really good details. Oh, a good question here about do we read the screen from right to left? And so um, in, in some Japanese screen painting, you, you might approach it from right to left. In these battle scenes, the progression of the narrative is generally from right to left, but it's not as, um, it's sort of floating key scenes from the story. It's not as linear. That's a good question. The screen evokes some wonder, awe, the beauty, and excitement. And I 
can see some questions emerging down here too. Move my text box out of the way. There's a lot happening. We have questions here. Who made this painting? Who are these people? And what's going on? How literal is the story? And when do they make it? And what does this mean to the viewer? So these are all really, really good questions. I can answer some of them and then I may defer to Andrea for some others. Um, but this is a screen painting of a story called The Tale of the Heike, which was actually um, sort of a, a loose loose recollection of a period in history of the Genpei War, and I'll ask Andrea to talk a little bit more about that piece. But um, the question in terms of how literal is the storytelling, this sort of recalls key scenes from the epic, this epic, which is has like over a thousand characters and is a series of many stories, and so the screen just sort of recalls some of those key events. Um, and the story, was, or the screen painting, even though the, the, the story was told mostly in like the 12th, 13th century by storytellers, the screen painting was created in the um, 17th 17th century, so it was actually hundreds of years later, sort of recalling recalling the epic and during a period of actual peace. So Andrew, can you expand a little bit about the significance of the story and um, why it might have been popular during this peaceful time? Um, yeah, so... Um, the Tale of the Heike is, uh, was spread as an oral epic. These uh, people would go around and perform it at like marketplaces and stuff, at periodic markets. Um, and they were using a text that was also based on um, a text that was written in uh, by uh, people about 40 years after the actual battle. So um, they're were a lot of famous episodes that through this process of sort of oral storytelling around the country became very famous. Um, and a lot of those are actually depicted on the screens. Um, and uh, it's a good story. And uh, the the tale of the Heike itself is very famous. Like the Heike themselves are very famous. And because they are the losers in the story, they're also sort of very poignant. Um, so. The whole thing uh, became very well known, and individual episodes became extremely, extremely well known. So, uh, yeah. Thanks. I think, Andrea, that was helpful. And this format of just representing stories like this on gold screens was um, had a practical function as well. Besides sort of showing one's wealth, these screens actually worked to light up the room. So. They were very functional. You know, there wasn't electricity at the time, and so being able to pull in the reflection of light and then using the gold to light up the room, the sort of golden cloud format was very popular among screens. So we're going to look at a couple different examples um, and go deeper into the story. Uh, Charlotte, do you want to continue? Sure. So at this part of the webinar, we're going to try a very daring um, experiment. We're going to see if we are able to go, if I am able to take you to see a video. And it's just, um, we haven't tried this before, so we'll see how it works. So here's how we're going to do this. I'm going to send you to a link to a video that I will also put in the chat box in case me sending you there doesn't work. And then I, I'm going to ask you to look at the video, and when you're finished, please raise your hand in the chat, uh, raise your hand using the, the little 
uh, the button that's underneath uh, your underneath your name in the participant box so that I know that you've finished and we can go on. I can return us all to the slideshow because it takes us to a different place when we go to the video. All right, we're going to try this now. Great, I think that worked. <laughs> so exciting. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm glad that worked for us to view that video um, made by the Asian Art Museum and having one of our docents tell us a little bit about the tale of the Heike. So this video is available on the museum's website. And like all the other images that we're showing in the webinar, um, it is available for you to use with your students in your classroom. And the PDF that is accompanying this webinar has um, information about where to find the different images and videos, as well as um, copies of the graphic organizers. So you don't have to look at the PDF now, but just know that all that information is in that packet for you to use in your classroom with your students. I'm sorry if you heard that. That was my computer. OK. Now we, we uh, let's see. Let me see where we are. Hold on a minute. OK. So we heard from Andrea and Karen and also from the storyteller some more information about the screen, about the tale of the Heki. And the next activities are about moving some of this, um, think, some of this thinking into a in, uh, direction of critical media literacy. So first, we're going to focus on the screen as an object, as a screen. I think it was Karen who mentioned that these screens display the status and wealth and heritage of their samurai owners and were prominently displayed in their house. The gold that was, that's on the uh, screen, the gold leaf or the gold paint, uh, reflects their wealth. But it also, I think uh, Karen mentioned, that it reflected light into the room. So not unlike uh, our big screen televisions today, prominently displayed in many people's living rooms, projecting light into our living rooms and other spaces, as well as telling stories. So one way you can uh, bring these medieval screens into the present is by comparing them to storytelling screens now and explain that they had a similar function. And the next exercise um, is to help the students think about comparing the screens, how they, function, how they function in their own time and uh, context. So again, using the text tool, um, let's write in some ideas, some answers of what is different about these two screens. With your students, you can use this graphic organizer. Um, and you can also talk about that the television screen or the, our monitors are also our computers and our iPads and our phones. So let's just uh, have a go at this activity and see what we come up with. Use your text tool to answer some of these questions. And as you're filling in the questions, I just want to mention you can also prompt your students to think about how these two screens, one painted gold and the other one a light box of sorts, um, how they project images and stories about many things, but including stories about war. So you can also um, have these lessons and your discussions with your students lead to a discussion about 
the representation of soldiers, samurai in the case of the screen, and thinking about how we represent images of war. Great, so we have a lot of interesting responses here. And we can see how different these two media are. So this is a chance to reflect with your students here on the different messages or the different kinds of um, images and messages that we're able to get through the different screens, how they're similar, how they're different. And who, who gets to tell the story, who it's for, hearing a little bit about um, how the screen functioned in medieval times and how we had storytellers be physical people in the marketplace. I believe you said something about that, Andrea. How different that is from watching stories on your television or on the internet. Of course, we can now watch the storytellers on the internet the way we all just did. So there can be some interesting discussions about technology as a result of this activity. All right, very interesting. We're going to move on. So the next uh, direction in which you can take your students is to look at, just to go a little deeper into the actual images and representations of the two, of the two medium, but also just to look at the images themselves. Here is a detail from the screen of one of the battles from the tale of the Heiki. And just for fun comparison, we came up with this other image that is an illustration by Tomer Hanuka from a recent uh, translation uh, release um, called Of the Tale of the Heiki. And this, um, this citation is also in your packet. But just noticing how different these two images are. So you could also, and we can try it out now by just hearing some of your comments in the chat box, just to think about these two different illustrations. One's a painting, one's an illustration. But one is from a long time ago, one's more recent. How are they um, different and similar, these two images? Just to think about form a little bit with the students. Um, what what kind of different feelings are evoked uh, by representing the battle in the way that the screen does and in the way that this illustration that is much more recent does, what, what might be different and similar. So go ahead and use the chat box to share your thoughts. Oh, and I see that there's been comments in the chat box. <laughs> OK. Karen's telling us that the full video introduces the story and gives a little historical context. Thank you, Karen. Yes, we just watched a, a section of the full video. 
All right, here are some answers. Bronia. The newer version is much more concerned with the individual battle experience. And the older screen, more of a way to give an impression of the battle in general. That's a great observation. How the close-up focuses on these two individuals. There's, there's a bit of gore going on there. We can see the blood coming out of the, on the sword. So that's a way to talk about maybe um, individuality versus this bigger picture of the, um, of the groups. Great. That's a great observation. So you can, with your students, talk about the differences and similarities of those two images and then maybe use this is a launching pad to get into more um, a larger, more general conversation about how soldiers are portrayed in these images, but also in other images that, that students may see around us, especially as we are in a time of so many wars right now that in some ways are very, well, depending on who we are, distant or close from. Um, but to talk about how soldiers are portrayed in the images we see around us, whether that's on our um, light box screens or in um, other advertising billboards or other kinds of media around us. And it's a chance to get into a discussion about the messages that these images present to us about war. Um, and I included here uh, um, the quote, the famous quote from Marshall McLuhan, which of course we'd have to explain to students who that is, just a, a theory, a, the, a theorist on, um, on media, thinking about does the media affect the message, the, or the, is the media the message, and using the examples that we've presented so far to make those points. So we won't go into these um, these questions right now for the in the interest of time, but um, it's just to, to let you know that these are directions in which you can take your students to think a little more deeply on issues of, of critical media literacy. And depending on how much you've, you've worked with your students on this concept of critical media literacy, um, maybe they might be familiar with it. But if not, um, you can also, um, whoops, let's see, here we go. You can also have the students themselves generate what kinds of questions do we need to ask of images. Um, so have them generate some of those questions. Uh, and, and here on this next slide, I have some of the possible questions that you might lead them towards. But just I'm curious what, what might come out of our little group today. What are some? What are some questions that you think we need to ask of images we have around us? And particularly thinking about those images that represent soldiers or battles or war. So I'm curious as to what comes out right now. So using the text tool again, uh, see what you think. Welcome, KE. I see that we've been joined by yet another person. Welcome. We're uh, just not in the middle of the webinar, but you're welcome to join us for the rest of it. And then it is recorded, so you can go back and listen to it from the beginning. We will make the link to the recording available. But welcome, KE. So we are right now asking questions um, of images in particular about soldiers, battles, and wars. And we're using the text tool 
which is on your uh, toolbox to the left. It is the fourth one down. Um, if you if you want to just jump in, if not, if you want to just hang out, that's fine too, because I understand it might be a little disorienting. But here's where the text tool is. So these are some great questions about audience. Who is the audience? What is the message? What are other ways to look at this topic? So other perspectives. This is definitely one of the global competencies that um, we talk a lot about at World Savvy, the importance of hearing from multiple perspectives. So that would be a great question to bring up with your students. Are we only hearing one side of the story? Is the overall tone impression positive or negative? That's great. And then maybe going into even positive or negative aspects of both uh, depicting um, these images or these messages as positive or negative. I don't know if I made that clear, but just how, how important both might be. What happened before and what happened next? So giving some histor uh, historical context to the images would be very important, some background information. This is an interesting question. What qualities does a hero have? Yeah, maybe thinking more deeply into what makes a warrior or a hero is can be a very good way of, of getting um, into some of our values and attitudes about war. Our previous webinar, which was about the samurai, gets into this a little deeper. So I would highly recommend for those of you who are new to our series to go back and listen to the recording of our previous webinar, which was called, um, I'm, I'm forgetting, oh, it's right here. It's uh, on the samurai. It's called Symbols of Protection and strength. And that webinar got into asking deeper questions around what, what is a warrior and suggesting to look at um, everyday people in our communities as warriors. So that might be a great place to go after this lesson. You can use them interchangeably. They don't have to be in the numerical order that we're presenting them. Great, and who are soldiers fighting for? So these are some great questions emerging from, from this brainstorm of asking what are the important questions to ask of images, which is a, a, a crucial component of critical media literacy. And here we just have a few more. Um, some of them might be redundant to what we already uh, stated. How does it make us feel? What is missing? Some of this was um, brought up in other ways. What language is being used? What are the sources? That's an important question to ask of media, you know, verifying your sources. So especially in this era of internet saturation, uh, all of us, but our students as well, are saturated with so many conflicting messages that it's good to teach them um, to verify their sources, especially on the internet. And whose story it is and who's telling the story are other two important questions. Um, stories tend to be more, most powerful when one is telling one's own story or one's own um, community, but it's, it's also sometimes not possible and other people telling the story but always questioning who that person is and what is their relationship to the people in the story is also important. So these are other questions to ask of our images. In our last 10 minutes, um, I'd like to spend some time with, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to actually jump to a slide that I skipped um, back here. I just want to um, hear from you all, get some feedback as to what you might think the purpose was of the various comparisons we did of the screens, the storytelling screens. If you could use the chat box to respond um, what, what you think the purpose of us comparing, and I'll go back to show you. We did two comparisons, 
we did the comparing of the screens here. So comparing these two media. And then we also did the, um, I'll jump ahead to the other one we did, which was comparing the two forms of battle. So I'm just wondering if you could share a few thoughts of um, what the purpose of these two comparisons, what the purpose in, is for you of doing these two. And you can use the chat box to respond. Hmm. Anybody have any ideas? <laughs> if no one has any ideas, we can move on. I'm not seeing any responses. Oh, I'm sorry. I do see the responses now. I just didn't scroll down. Okay, so we have Briona saying, I think there are multiple purposes, but the most obvious one is comparing old to new helping students relate historical information to their own lives. This not only engages them, but encourages them to look critically at their world. Thank you. <laughs> it just takes time to type. I know. <laughs> Sorry if I was impatient. I hadn't scrolled down my chat box either. Yes, you, you, you basically hit um, at least one of the reasons why I chose to do that is exactly as you say, bringing it into the present. So thank you for that. And now I'd like to spend some time just to reflect on, on the question of storytelling. And this is another place where with your students you can expand um, on this theme into even um, homework assignments of asking students to um, go home and, and notice with their families or their community or just pay attention to the different stories told in their lives. There's many things you can um, do in taking this theme of storytelling further. But for right now, and you can use these questions with your students as a way of reflecting uh, on the lesson and to close. We have four questions here about around story, stories and storytelling. If you could pick one, Type the number into the chat box with your answer. And this is a way for us to, um, to each pick, pick a different aspect of, of this reflection. So go ahead and pick one question and type your answer in the chat box. Oh, I also didn't want to skip over the rest of the answers in the chat box. It seems there's a delay with my chat box. But yes, uh, Bronia also said that any kind of comparison encourages critical thinking. And Karen said to compare how artists represent the same story in different ways. The tone of the illustration is action and violence, and the screen has a sense of pride. OK, so it looks like. Um, KE is taking question four. So go ahead and take t your time. So we have KE um, answering question four, which is where are stories told? They're told in homes, community centers, libraries, festivals, and special events and museums. That's great. Karen is, is uh, telling us about who are storytellers in your life. You, I am treated daily by the storytellers at the Asian Art Museum who help bring stories like the tale of the Heike alive. It's so nice. 
Thank you both. And I responded that I, to number two, that I tell stories at, at meal times. And Bronia says, stories are told everywhere, advertisements, Facebook, the news. We're used to story times in the library, but there's so many different versions of stories now. That's a great point. Different versions, depending on who's telling the story, especially when it comes to war battles and battles and soldiers. So these are great reflections. Just waiting to see if there's anything else. K.E. says, I think there is a difference between stories and the art of storytelling. That's, we would love to hear more, K.E., if you want to press your talk button and elaborate a little bit more on what you mean, we would love to hear from you, especially since you joined us a little later. And Andrea says, agreed. <laughs> Bronia brings up a great point. I'm not a big fan of video games, but my students know who Manuel Noriega is because of Black Ops. Well, I don't know what Black Ops that is, except that it's a video game, but I'm curious now. So would anybody like to share, uh, use your talk button and share a little bit more about what you might mean of those two things? I'm thinking specifically about the difference between stories and the art of storytelling. Oh, K.E. is telling us, um, she's typing, she might not be able to use the talk button. She or he, we don't know. <laughs> Storytelling and oral tradition transmit culture. Okay. Thank you, K.E. Now, since we only have two minutes left, I'm just going to, um, I'm going to actually skip over these charts, which are basically just matching our learning goals from the beginning to our different activities. But let's, as a way of departing from each other, if you could please um, either type in the chat box or also select, or you alternately, you can select your talk button and share with us verbally. If you could type in chat box one thing that you are taking from this webinar today, or how you plan to apply um, this webinar to your classroom teaching. So please share with us uh, your answers to one of those two questions. KE is telling us that um, they're going to review the webinar and share with the staff at Downtown High School, which is project-based, and they'll be able to adapt these strategies. Great to hear. I take it you're from Downtown High School. Um, I personally am going to think more about this question between uh, the difference between stories and storytelling. Okay. Andrea is thinking about the role of media and screens in our daily lives. Thank you, Andrea. And Bronia would like to share all of the different webinar videos with the rest of the humanities team at her school. Absolutely. Yes, please 
can share this with whoever you'd like. All these resources are on the um, museum website, and we encourage you to use them. And I'll just hand it over in parting to Karen to see if Karen would like to add anything about the resources. Thanks so much. I'm so glad that you're finding some of these resources useful. And so what I'll do is I'll pull together a short list with some links and email you guys. Um, and we are just continuing to add to our education portal. And we're trying to add more student-centered short videos. So um, I'll keep you in the loop as we, as we update those. But then as you continue to have needs, just email me um, or give me a call and let me know because right now we're doing, um, we're doing quite a bit of um, video content development. And so we want to make sure that we're sort of going in the direction that's really useful to you. Does Thank you, everybody for participating in the webinar. And we would love to have your feedback about the webinar itself, as well as um, just anything you'd like to share, how we can make it more useful for you, as Karen said. And Karen, how would people provide feedback? Just put my talk button on. So what we'll do is we'll send you a link to an evaluation form as well. and. Um, and you can just provide some, it's a couple quantitative questions and then any other extra notes um, will give you a chance to do that as well. So thank you so much. I'm glad. This is sort of new, new terrain for us and um, World Savvy with Charlotte and, and Andrew at UC Berkeley have been so helpful. So it's, it's learning. So as you guys have feedback, just let us know. Thank you all, and thank you, Andrea, thank you. for joining us from Tokyo at 2.30 in the morning. We really appreciate that. Go back to sleep now.